G'day, I'm Yogi Sandev and in part 6 of this series, Unity for the Absolute Beginner, we will be looking into scripting. Alright, so scripting it is. So today is an introduction into scripting. We'll do a brief rundown on the makeup of the default script that gets auto-generated each time you create a new script in Unity. Uh, we'll also write and run a brief script to demonstrate the difference between start and update methods. Uh, so you get a lot of exposure to classes, variables, public versus private variables, the debug statement, RAM statements, and uh, standard calculations. So let's get going. So I'm going to assume that you have Visual Studio installed to edit your C-sharp scripts. If you are using a different script editor, then that's fine, uh, but you might be missing some contextual stuff along the way. I do have a video for Visual Studio installation, and it's part of this series, and the link should be showing up on the top of your screen now. So as you probably already know, a script is a set of instructions that will be carried out by the program. Uh, without some kind of scripting, you would just have a bunch of objects in your scene not doing much at all. Doesn't sound like much fun. So yep, scripting is needed. Right, so I have a clean project open, so let's have a look inside the basic auto-generated default c -sharp script that Unity creates each time you create a new script. So right-click in your project window and select Create and Folder, and we're going to name it Scripts. Always good practice to have all of your scripts in a scripts folder. Then right click on the scripts folder and select create and C sharp script. Let's call it script one. Double click to open it. And as long as you have your editor selected in the Unity preferences, it will open. All right, so let's take a look. Okay, so firstly, as you can see, I'm using a dark theme. Uh, if you want to change your theme in Visual Studio, you can click tools and then theme to select your preferred color scheme. All right, let me just get mine back to dark. Cool. Uh, also, I'm only using two windows in here. Uh, I'm using the script window for scripting, and I'm using the output window for any errors that Visual Studio sees along the way. Uh, that's usually all I use. If you want to have a look at other windows, you can. You can click View, and you can see them from there. Unity Project Explorer is pretty cool. Uh, that shows you all of your scripts in your project and they can be opened from that window as well. All right, that's enough of that. Uh, I could be here all day going through all the features of Visual Studio. So just a brief overview of what's in here. First of all, at the top, you can see some using statements. Uh, one way of putting this is that these statements are accessing libraries and packages in the script. There are more libraries that can be accessed and we will actually tap into some of those as we progress through the series. But the ones you have up there right now, you have System Collection and System Collection Generic. Uh, they are standard Microsoft C Sharp libraries. If you are using Visual Studio, you can hover over the word Collections and press F1 on your keyboard, and it should open up a web page with those collections and what they entail. Uh, let me have a look down here. So you can see I Enumerator in there, for example. So let me just close this. So if I put I enumerator statement in the script, now watch what happens if I disable these collections. So Visual Studio now has no idea what I'm talking about. Now, yeah, I could type in the full path and say system.collections.ienumerator, but that would be just too much work every time. All right, let me just get rid of this and re-enable the collection and voila, it's back. And the Unity Engine, well, that's a must because it's a library, but it also contains the all-important mono behavior class, which every default script in Unity needs. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. So don't worry too much about these libraries and classes at this point. Just knowing why they are there is good enough. So public class script one is the name of our file and it is also the name of the class. Uh, just one point to note here, if further down the track you do decide to rename one of your scripts in your project, then you must remember to rename the class in the script. It won't automatically update it for you. So for example, let me just close this. 
If we rename script one to script two, and now reopen the script, and you can see it still says script one. So we have to manually rename it to script two and control S to save. So the class itself for each script is its own collection of variables and functions, etc. I could type out a bunch of functions in this script here and actually share them with other scripts too. All I would have to do is use this script's class in another script. Anyway, we'll get to doing more of that down the series. Okay, so now mono behavior. Well, we were just talking about classes and here is one right here. This one is 99.9% .9 of the time a must in your script. Uh, not much would work without it. Usually you will see it in a Unity script. If you don't see it, then you can bet that the script is probably inheriting it from another script. The mono behavior means that script one inherits from mono behavior. So it's using everything that that class mono behavior has to offer. If you hold your control key down and click the word mono behavior, it will open the class and you can see some of the methods inside. So as you can see, it saves you a lot of time having these methods and functions in mono behavior because then we don't have to type everything out each time because we already have it. All right, back to the script. So we have these two methods here, start and update. So start is the method that runs first when the script runs and it runs only once. Uh, method on the other hand runs continuously and once every frame. So if your game was running at 30 frames per second, then everything in that update method will run 30 times a second. Pretty quick. Uh, so let's put them to the test. So we're going to type in a piece of code to add something. So firstly we need a variable. So think of a variable as a storage container with a label, uh, like coffee or tea. You can have lots of storage containers for different things. You can have numbers, balls, game objects, vectors, uh, components, etc. So we're going to create a storage container today for a number. So we first have to create the container. After the first curly bracket after public class, type in private space int space sum equals zero. So private just means that nothing else in the game or inspector can see it. Uh, you'll see what I mean about that in a short while. INT is declaring that it's a number and it's an integer, which means that there's no decimal points. It's a whole number. And the sum is the name of the variable. We're just labeling the container. Probably wasn't the best of names, but it'll do. And equals zero is the default value of sum. Uh, we don't need to specify it, but we're going to specify zero in here. And then the semicolon at the end is just to end the statement, just telling the script that that's the end of the line and continue. Now inside start, enter debug dot log bracket sum in bracket semicolon. So debug dot log is telling Unity to print an output to our debug window, our console window. In this case, we want to output the value of sum. Uh, and don't forget the semicolon at the end of the statement. Um, actually, now I think about it, let's get a little more fancy. Let's put some text in there as well. So let's change it. Uh, let's put speech marks. The sum is and in speech marks plus sum. So, okay, so now it's going to print what's in between the speech marks and it's going to print the sum. So it's going to say the sum is zero. All right, press control S to save and you can either minimize or close. Now press play and see what happens. Nothing, no output. Why? Because the script is not attached to anything in the scene. Uh, any object that's not in the scene obviously can't be seen. So in the same way, any script not in the scene won't run. So right click in your hierarchy and select create empty. And let's name it script practice. Now drag script two onto script practice. If you click script practice now, you should see that our script two is now attached. Uh, because it's attached to the object and the object is in the scene, it will now run. Um, also, just make sure you've got your console window open so you can actually see the output and press play. And boom, there it is. It's printed. The sum is zero. So it printed it once because we have it in start. Remember, start runs first and only runs once. Uh, now, just uh, for a second, back to that private public thingy we were talking about before. Click the script practice object and look in the inspector. So we only see transform and script two. We see nothing else. 
double click your script to open it again, change private to public in your variable declaration up here. Uh, control S to save, close or minimize, and now click script practice. So now you can see the variable sum in the inspector because we made it public. So you can now change the default starting value of that variable to anything you want and it will override the script default value of zero and it will stick. You close the project and reopen it and that value will still be there. Uh, let's change it to 22. Now push play and voila, the window is showing 22. So keeping things public while you're making the game is uh, pretty useful and you can make changes on the fly, but it's always good practice to make them private where you can. There are other options which you'll learn later in this series where you can do more than just simple private and public and you can even protect things from being changed. But we'll get to that later. So let's continue on. So we've seen the code run once in the start menu. Now let's try the update method. All right, so open up your script again. Now you can highlight uh, our line of code and left click drag it into update. Control S to save. Minimize or close and run. So it's printing the same message over and over again once per frame. Depending on the speed of your computer, it's probably going to be pretty quick. Uh, rather than repeat an identical output over and over, the debug window is going to group the messages and just show you the count of them here. So let me look at my stats here. Yeah, so that's pretty quick. FPS rate uh, looks like around 500 frames per second. Uh, well, it should be quick because there's nothing in the scene. So it's basically printing that message approximately 500 times a second. It's pretty cool. Okay, let's open up our script again and try something a little different. Above our line of code, let's put sum equals sum plus one. So we're now telling the computer to add one to the sum each time update is cycled. So it's basically counting really fast. Control S and minimize and push play. So now you can see the same message, but the sum number is increasing. There's nothing to group here because each output message is different because of the sum number. All right, so that's a quick example of start and update. Uh, so let's go back to the script. So if at any time you want to put a comment or a rem statement in your script, you can use two backslashes and then uh, type your comment. So let's do, um, so above your two lines of code, type in, let's see, backslash, backslash, show the sum plus one every frame. So that green line will be completely ignored when the script runs. Rem statements are gonna be very useful for reminding yourself or others of doing something in your script. Um, you can see in the default script here, there are already two rem lines telling you what each method does. Um, I personally call it rem, because I've been programming since before Windows even came out in BASIC and QBASIC and REM was actually a statement back then uh, and it meant remark. Um, so I've always said REM since then. It might be called other things now, but I'm sticking with REM. Uh, also, if you wanna do a multi-line REM, uh, you can use a backslash and an asterisk like this at the start and then this at the end. Uh, the asterisk is the asterisks on each line don't need to be there, but Visual Studio will drop them there automatically. Um, okay, something else, keeping code tidy. So this right here is very simple and short, but when you start getting really into it and there's just way more lines of code in the script can get really messy. So along with rem statements to help keep track of things, you can also try to keep your formatting in check. Uh, I'll remind you about this further in the series when we have way more code to play with. But let's just uh, mess this up a little. So it's all out of whack here. Okay, so now I can click edit and then advanced and then format document and it will tidy things back up for me. Cool. So everything's back to normal. Um, so it doesn't always work the way you might like it, but it's generally pretty useful, pretty, quite helpful. Um, and notice that it, of course, ignores rem formatting. So, so far we've pretty much quickly covered uh, the basic default script in Unity, uh, the start and run methods, a brief introduction into using in classes, uh, the variables uh, in the series, there's going to be a lot of variables, so you're going to get used to those anyway. 
public versus private variables. We'll look into those more in a series as well. Um, REM statements obviously being ignored by the script and the debug.log for outputting messages to your output window. Um, you're going to be using that more for finding bugs. Um, if you've got a script and you've got a, a hundred lines of code and you're wondering if something's actually getting somewhere where it's supposed to be, you can put a debug log in there to just say print I'm here and you can figure out where your application has actually got a hiccup. So it will be very useful for things like that. In the next video, I think we will finally make something happen in the scene. Uh, I think we'll probably work on the transform function, which as the name might suggest, can manipulate transform properties of an object, position, rotation, and size. So we will use it to move some stuff around the scene. Uh, because we are using the transform, you'll also get exposure to vectors and vector three. Of course, we need those because in order to transform something in a 3D world, you're gonna need the three axes X, Y, Z. And if the video doesn't get too long, we might throw in some input so we can control the transforms with the keyboard, up, down, left, right, and all that stuff. So I hope to see you in the next video.